So welcome to episode 97 of the podcast. I'm Doug Wilson. Thanks for joining us. So I want to begin by talking about one of the things that distinguishes conservatives or um, people who have a conservative disposition from progressives. Uh, as we're considering social problems or social challenges or, or areas of our lives that, are, that exhibit some form of injustice or another, what do we do? Well, conservatives tend, we, we all think that equality is a good thing. But we need to uh, fit that word into its context. Equality of what? Equality where? Equal in what respects? Uh, Conservatives tend to want equality of opportunity. And progressives tend to want equality of outcome. All right. So uh, conservatives want equal rules during the game. They want equality of mind among the refs. They want clipping for one side to be clipping for another. If one side has to go 10 yards for a first down, you can't have it be that the other side gets to go five yards for a first down. So uh, conservatives want equal application of the rules, equal application of the laws, equal uh, application of the, of the judgment calls that the refs make. So uh, the refs should be, when, when, they're, when they're talking about um, unsportsmanlike conduct or holding or offsides or whatever call they're making, they ought to be colorblind with regard to the color of the jersey. Um, if, if it's a foul, it's a foul. Um, you ought not to be favoring one side over the other. So a conservative understanding of equality is equality of treatment, equality of process, equality of equal opportunity. Progressives tend to want equality of outcome. In other words, they want the score. They want equality on the scoreboard. Um, Conservatives want equality in the rules and in the application of the rules. Progressives want equality or as close to equal as you can get on the scoreboard, which is why when progressives seize control of your parks and recs program, one of the first things to go is keeping score. Uh, the kids <laughs> or the parents of the kids are reduced to keeping track of how many runs there were in their notebooks in the stands. So uh, they, they, they want to eliminate the score. They don't want disparity of outcome. Now, here's the thing. There's, that's, I think, a fairly obvious uh, difference. But there's another difference that under undergirds this. If um, in order to ensure equality of outcome, and now I'm, I'm zooming out so that we're looking at society as a whole, and we're talking about uh, equality of outcome when it comes to income and uh, opportunity and educational opportunities and, all, you know, the hundreds of variables that affect all of our lives every day. In order to ensure equality of outcome that way, the people running the show have to be functionally omnipotent and omniscient. In order to, so if you took a a modestly sized town, uh, Moscow, Idaho, where I live, has got a little over 20,000 people in it. So you've got 20,000 people. In order to govern our affairs, let's say you are the great sky mayor of this town, and you wanted to ensure that all the students at the high school got roughly the same grades, that all the first-time employees were offered roughly the same salary, had to work roughly the same number of hours, everything had to be comparable. In order to bring that about, you would have to be God. You would have to, and that's, you would have to have divine powers simply to pull that off for a small town. Uh, but you don't have to be that if, if you have a rule that says, hey, everybody, everybody in this town has to drive on the right side of the road. Or everybody in this town has to stop at this light when it's red. Those, those sorts of um, things are, 
are things we can handle. In other words, you could have a modestly sized police department and they could successfully get everybody to drive on the right side of the road and to stop at, uh, stop at the red light and so on. But there's no conceivable way uh, that they could get equality of outcome, outcome apart from um, this, uh, uh, apart from assuming to themselves all the prerogatives of deity, which is right on the surface of it. That should tell us right there that this is a bad idea. So the book I want to recommend to you this time, this time being episode 97 of our podcast, is Holiness by J.C. Ryle. This has been published a number of times by different publishers. Um, uh, the edition um, that I have by Charles Nolan Publishers um, is very nice. If you can, if you can find that in a used bookstore somewhere, but numerous publishers have have uh, put it out. J. C. Ryle was uh, the Bishop of Liverpool. He was an Anglican of the nineteenth century and an evangelical. Uh, so he was Low Church Anglican, Bishop of Liverpool, and he wrote really sturdy, simple prose. Um, Ryle is a master of clarity. He's not a, he's not a flamboyant writer. He's not, um, you know, he, he's not uh, weighed down with loads of adjectives. He is just very straightforward, a very straightforward uh, writer. He, he, he um, wrote a very fine booklet called Simplicity in Preaching, where he's commending this approach. I, can, I recommend that booklet also, uh, especially to preachers. Um, don't use a 50 cent word when, uh, you know, um, don't use a $5 word when a 50 cent word will do that, that kind of thing. Don't, don't, um, don't become highfalutin. Be straightforward, simple, pithy, memorable. So uh, Ryle uh, does that. In this book, Holiness, he uh, presents or urges the classic reformed understanding of sanctification, which is at once once we've got the gospel straight, once we've called upon the Lord, once we've been born again, once we've been forgiven, and we were converted, let's say on Tuesday morning, that justification occurs at that point. The righteousness of Christ is imputed to us at that point. Well, then the process of figuring out how to live like a Christian begins. So the fact that the righteousness of Christ was imputed to you for your justification means that after that time, if you're hit by a bus, you go straight to be with the Lord. You belong to God. You, your status with God has been settled for all time because you're justified. But your experience of that acceptance is not going to be, it varies from day to day. It might be very different. You might have a bad week. You might have a bad day. You might have a bad six-month stretch where you're, where it's hard to trust God or it's hard to walk with him or you seem uh, defeated by a particular sin. So the process of sanctification is a long and arduous one. And what Ryle is doing is he's presenting the classic Reformed understanding of what it is to grow in holiness. And this book is just an, uh, an, an enormous help, I think, to the average Christian um, who wants to, um, to be holy in God's um, presence, to be holy in God's sight, and not just to be holy in God's sight because he's justified and has the righteousness of Jesus Christ, but he wants to be holy he wants the kind of holiness that his neighbors can see. He wants the kind of holiness that his wife can see and understand or his, uh, or his kids can see and understand. He wants holiness that's tangible and practical, that uh, holiness that comes at your fingertips. So this book, Holiness by J.C. Ryle, I commend it to you. Great book. Have at it. Find it somewhere and read it. So, coming to hamartiology in podcast episode 97, uh, the word apageo is used only once in the New Testament, 
and it means to be past feeling. Apalgeo, apalgeo. Paul uses the word to describe what happens to the conscience, to the, what happens to the consciences of those who walk in this world without God. He says in Ephesians 4, 19 and 20, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. So he's talking about those whose consciences have been seared, whose moral sensibilities have been deadened. They can't feel it anymore. Guilt is, um, guilt is like a moral nerve ending. How would you do, uh, how would your five-year-old son do, let's say, in the backyard if he had no sense of pain whatever, if he couldn't feel anything? Well, he would rapidly destroy himself. If you couldn't feel fire when it burned, if you couldn't feel sharp things when they poked you, if you couldn't feel it when you fell out of a tree, uh, you wouldn't have any reason to shrink back from certain things that would be uh, harmful. <coughs> Excuse me. In the same way, um, guilt or a conscience or a, uh, a feeling of moral um, shame or dread or, uh, you know, uh, is a grace from God. It's a gift from God. If we didn't have that sense, we would rapidly destroy ourselves morally. You've spent a pleasant half hour with podcast proprietor Douglas Wilson. This podcast is produced by Canon Press. Please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite listening platform. To hear more from Doug, please visit canonpress.com.